Around 20 years ago, video game producer Elizabeth Braswell's boss walks into her office and asks her to do a game based on Skittles, as in Taste the Rainbow Skittles. Uh, Braswell replied, you have two choices, you can fire me now and make the next year and a half much easier on me, or you can not make me do this. That night, Braswell did what any reasonable person would do and got very drunk at a New York bar, thinking that that was her career done and dusted. But with alcohol comes a whole new world of colourful decision making, and in that moment, during that night, Braswell decided that she would make the game, and Darkened Sky was born. A game that from afar has absolutely nothing to do with Skittles. The front cover blends right into that era of fantasy and RPG games, and the back cover does too, with no giveaways unless you zoom right into the legal text at the bottom to see that Skittles and Taste the Rainbow are registered trademarks of Mars Incorporated. I was like, how can I get Skittles in the game without having Skittles in the game? What I finally came up with was to do the game based on the world of the ads. I used it as a chance to do the game I've always wanted to do and have never been able able to, which is a third-person action-adventure fantasy with humour and Skittles. These mid to late 90s ads she's talking about were a series of offbeat bizarre fantasy affairs. A dude climbing a mountain letting his colourful birds free only for it to rain Skittles, a wizard summoning Skittles from the sky, a lady with a horse at Stonehenge doing the same, that sort of thing. Uh, the Mars Company's market research showed that Skittles' popularity declined among those older than 20 years of age, so this advertising campaign was a part of a reach towards that older demographic, and this game being loosely based on the world of these ads was an attempt to do the same. Because of this, we ended up with a surprisingly normal looking third person fantasy game. Uh, like with the box art, there's no immediate giveaways while playing this that it has anything to do with Skittles. Its more muted colour palette and gothic imagery only reinforce that this seemingly has no involvement with colourful sugary sweets, but they're in here. Not as an edible treat, but rather as the rare source of all magic. Uh, you collect Skittles throughout the game and use combinations of them to equip your spells, most of which are ranged combat spells, but there's also spells for stuff like seeing secrets, lighting up dark spaces, shrinking down in size, and walking on lava. In the darkened sky world, Skittles and magic and even vibrant colours have been outlawed by a devilish evil overlord dude, and it's up to Sky, our chosen one protagonist, to stop him and save the rainbow. Book ended by some very early 2000s CGI cutscenes, it very much sounds like boilerplate stuff, or, or would if it weren't for the whole Skittles thing, but some unusual aesthetic choices and particularly the game's sense of humour make it much more memorable than it would otherwise be. Sky and her gargoyle companion who only appears in cutscenes Drac are some of the most sarcastic video game protagonists that you'll ever come across. The old tuning forks in the wall near the hidden entrance shtick. Oh, come on, we can't do this puzzle till later. How do you know? I read the script. I mean, I had a sacred vision. Their voice actors were in the recording studio at the same time, which was pretty unusual in video games back then, and it clearly helps make their dynamic much more natural. Also, you may have noticed that Sky is voiced by Linda Larkin, who did Princess Jasmine in the 90s Aladdin movie. A hairpin. Now if this were an adventure game, I would just take it, for no apparent reason, in full view of the princess, who wouldn't say a word. I keep forgetting, this is an adventure game. The fourth wall is beyond broken, and it makes so much sense to have such a tongue-in-cheek style, considering how absolutely absurd it is that this is a Skittles game. It's a cheap, budgety game, so to make up for that, they spent a long time in pre-production, writing the script and designing the thing. And they went the extra mile by paying for good voicing, which clearly paid off. Uh, I just love how they even poke fun at it being a Skittles game. A Skittles. Mysteriously unaffected by centuries of digestive activity. You see, marketing didn't want us to show us Skittles all narfed up from stomach juices, so they decided... I'll shut up now. So exactly why aren't Skittles in the marketing or box art? Why does the Skittles game seem to have such contempt about it being a Skittles game? Who thought this was a good idea? Uh, after getting in touch with some of the people who worked on the game, I've figured out what happened, and it's just as ridiculous as you'd expect. Darkened Sky's publisher was Simon and & Schuster, who you may know as the prolific book publisher, but back in the mid to late 90s they were ramping up their video game branch, specialising in budget PC games, many of which were licensed. They made educational games, Star Trek games, a Daria game, Forbes Corporate Warrior, Who Wants to Beat Up a Millionaire, 
let's just say they made some pretty weird stuff. Oh, and they did EVE Online of all things. In the late 90s, Simon & Schuster negotiated with the Mars Company to buy the rights to publish M&M's games. And they published two, M&M's The Lost Formulas and M&M's Blast, both of which were aimed at kids and successful enough. The logic was that M&M's were a recognisable brand that would help sell these games to children, and it seemed to work, so Simon & Schuster were happy to pay for the M&M's license rather than Mars paying for the product placement. Off the back of that successful deal, Simon & Schuster tried to double dip by returning to the Mars company and paying for the Skittles license to try and sell a Skittles game, the game which ended up being Darkened Sky. So amazingly, the Skittles in Darkened Sky weren't paid advertising or product placement by Mars, the publisher instead paid money to Mars to add Skittles into their game. Even though Darkened Sky was aimed at a more mature audience, they still tried to follow the same logic train that they did with the M&M's games and thought that the inclusion of Skittles would somehow help sell more copies of the game rather than just alienate consumers and have them dismiss it as cheap licensed nonsense. But then that doesn't line up with the fact that there's no Skittles branding to be seen and that's because after the deal was made I guess that Simon & Schuster came to their senses and had a change of heart. During development, the game was called Skittles colon Darkened Sky, but towards the end of development, Simon & Schuster were so happy with how the game turned out that they figured that they should instead try and sell it as a standalone fantasy action-adventure game, and so they dropped the Skittles title and downplayed Skittles' involvement. They actually wanted to take the Skittles stuff out altogether at this point, but they were too far through development that it wasn't worth doing, so the game ends up feeling quite shy about it. So did Darkened Sky actually turn out well? Uh, sort of, but not really. It's complicated. Uh, developed by Boston Animation, who also developed one of the M&M's games, and despite their name were mostly situated in Kiev, Ukraine, Darkened Sky was first released on PC in January of 2002, and though I played the GameCube port from later that year, it certainly controls like an early 2000s PC third-person action game, in the vein of something like Rune or Jedi Outcast or American McGee's Alice. The camera is firmly locked behind you, movement is very quick and snappy, Happy, and the control mapping is more like a first person shooter. It actually takes a lot of cues from point and click adventure games though, there's plenty of puzzles which involve scanning the environment to find an item that you gotta use on some NPC to get another item to unlock a new area. Uh, virtually no level is a straightforward fight your way through affair. On the pause menu you can access Sky's running diary which functionally acts as hints for the puzzles and you'll need to read it and each item and spell's descriptions because the puzzles can get pretty cryptic. I enjoyed plenty of them, like there was one where you needed to get an E flat tuning fork, but you only had an E tuning fork, so you had to go find a press to literally flatten it, which is just amazing. Uh, other times it was fun collecting and deciphering clues, but there were equally as many puzzles that were just woefully underexplained. At one point you have to pick up fish that sometimes hop out of the water, fish that are hard to see and I didn't realise that you could pick up because you can't pick up the similar sized frogs, and then you have to happen to give those fish to the NPCs in the level to progress. Another time you use the ice spell on water to create yourself a platform, which is pretty obscure as it is, but at least the spell description says it freezes water, but then the spell just doesn't work on other bodies of water in other levels. With such uneven dodginess like this, you can just end up going in circles if you don't play the game with a walkthrough by your side, and the better puzzles are muddled by the doubt that the bad puzzles plant in your head. You'll be asking yourself if you're confused because you haven't figured something out, or if you simply don't have enough information to figure it out. The main problem though is less the puzzling itself and more just how so many things are so well hidden. I've spent what felt like hours just circling areas and scanning walls looking for that one button to progress, only for that button to be hidden in such an annoying spot that it just made me more angry at the game than myself. Uh, the very first level had me running back and forth stumped looking for a small animal, only for that animal to be tucked away in a hole in a tree towards the start of the level that I kept running straight past because you can only see the hole if you're standing right next to the tree. It's infuriating. One of my favourite levels on an aesthetic front is set in this traditional Chinese inspired temple. It's a great looking detailed level, but playing it is like a nightmarish puzzle box. 
Take this room for example. Every time you go near the walls, these giant axes swing through to hit you, and it's a room off the beaten path, so I figured it was a side room just to collect health from. There's plenty of those in this game. Uh, after moving past it and circling around the rest of the level for ages, it turns out that I needed to go through one specific wall back in that room to progress. It expected me to just try out every single wall. There was no diary entry or clues pointing me towards a specific wall, it's just a game that expects you to at times scan every single corner of every single level. Which is a much bigger problem in the earlier levels, not only because you're not accustomed to playing in such a careful manner, but also because the earlier levels feature a lot of precise, sometimes unreliable platforming. Movement is very twitchy, platforms are often very small, and one slight slip up and you're dead. Not to mention the game struggles with jumping if the ground is anything but flat, like occasionally it'll simply ignore your jump button press, I guess because the game doesn't think you're touching the ground when you are. It's unreliable and it's fidgety and it adds on to what was already a frustrating and janky experience. Also, as much as Sky jokes about not being able to swim, it is so annoying that she can't swim, especially when she can walk on lava. I see another island out there, but how do we get to it? How's your backstroke? Lousy. I'm a warrior hero adventurer goddess who can't swim, okay? After the first handful of levels, you'll have beaten the bulk of the frustrating platforming, only for it to be replaced with frustrating combat. Enemies do plenty of damage and take way too many hits before dying, there's no lock-on or auto-aim because this is a lazy port of the PC game, and aiming with the overly sensitive C-stick is painful, especially when the aiming reticule adjusts for depth. Granted, this is obviously less of a problem with a keyboard and mouse, but I couldn't even get the PC version running properly on my Windows XP machine. Enemies just feel thoughtlessly thrown into levels at random, sometimes they'll spawn right on you or behind you and immediately get an attack in, attacks can be chaotic and even impossible to avoid when things get busy, and the difficulty is so poorly balanced that regular enemies will often be harder to beat than the bosses. Enemies usually won't get knocked back or appear to react at all to your attacks, so the only thing giving the combat any punch is some flashy lighting and particle effects for each spell. The worst enemies are inarguably these flying monsters. They're so twitchy, so hard to hit, take so many hits to kill, and follow you around for entire levels if you ignore them. There were just so many times where I had to halt progression and just aim at the sky to try and duck hunt these things down for minutes before moving on, and what's worse is you don't really get rewarded for killing anything in this game. Sure, you might get health or a potion, but considering the amount of time it takes to kill anything and the chance that you'll just lose more health than you'd gain by fighting, it just makes you want to try and rush past combat altogether if you can. But you can't, because you need to carefully scan the levels to find the hidden buttons and doors all the time. The one saving grace is fittingly the fact that you can save anywhere, which further solidifies that this was just a quick PC port where you can basically quick save. And because of how annoying the game is to play, you'll want to save again and again and again. It's actually hard to scrub through my recorded footage because I kept pausing the game to save every few minutes. But if you don't do this, you restart the level and lose your items when you die, so you could lose up to 30 minutes. Long story short, the game is super frustrating. I think the notes I took while playing it are the most angry notes I've ever taken, and existence is suffering. Taste the rainbow. There's no real breaks from the annoying gameplay loop either, aside from one brief alright section where you ride around in circles collecting crystals. Uh, I actually didn't finish the game, I got right up to the very end and encountered an enemy who just never seemed to take damage while I couldn't really move, and that was as much as I could stomach, so I watched the last 10 minutes online. Not fun. But on the other side of the coin, you have quite a charmingly written game that takes you to plenty of interesting locations, from the pirate sky camp, to the castle ruins on water, to getting shrunk down to fight bugs in the tall grass, to a dark goblin fortress with steampunk looking tech, to what's basically hell. It does feel surprisingly inspired and varied all things considered. It even includes direct references to the ads, like you have to find the lost coloured birds for the bird guy, and you meet Merlin from the wizard ad, and you resurrect the lady with the horse. It's a silly novelty that this is a thing, but it does give the developers an excuse to vary up the locations a lot. 
So the more time passes, the more the frustration and annoying bits wash away in my memory and Darkened Sky's more unique elements stick out fondly. And it must be said that a lot of this stuff was more forgivable back in 2002, as evidenced by the game actually reviewing reasonably well. I can't in good conscience recommend Darkened Sky to anyone who's looking for something to enjoy in their spare time today though, it's simply way too maddening and I would not have played much of it if I weren't making this video. But I did enjoy making this video and I do appreciate its achievements. It's rare to see a game that's genuinely funny, especially from that era and genre, and it takes you on an unusual sugary journey. You've gotta love that 90s, 2000s, snarky, sarcastic attitude. Oh right, and now I'm just supposed to reach out like an idiot, burn my hand on the red hot key, and say something lame like, ow, I can't take that, it's too hot. Give me a little credit, huh? too hot! By all accounts, virtually everyone who worked on Darkened Sky loved working on it, specifically because they were allowed so much freedom. Normally licensed games are very restrictive, but if anything, this was the opposite. Uh, I got in touch with Elizabeth Braswell, the producer from earlier who almost quit when asked to make a Skittles game, and she had this to say about the game. Once I began the project, it was a ton of fun, and it allowed me, weirdly, to stretch creatively in terms of production. Up to that point, I had been doing a lot of Star Trek and similar licensed work, which of course are pre-made, preconceived universes. My only directive with Dark and Sky was to taste the rainbow. Okay, kidding. But as long as I used the candy and license in a respectful way, it was free range. I got to do everything I had dreamed of doing for years, from having a strong female lead to a specific kind of magic system to art that wasn't following trends at the time. Andy Wolfenden, the game's writer and designer, also shared a similar sentiment after I contacted him. We got hammered in the press for the Skittles content, and justifiably so, but I think overall we created an entertaining and fun game. We managed to score in the high 60s to mid 70s in the game review magazines. Nowadays, the game is seen as kind of a joke, the infamous Skittles game, but I like its combination of adventure game, RPG, and action. The magic system was unique. The low budget didn't allow us to be competitive in the graphics and game engine areas, but I think we made up for that shortcoming in the writing, design, and voice. I had fun playing playing it anyway. And I think that's a nice place to leave Darkened Sky's story. It's a story of trying to make something out of nothing. What at first seemed like an awful premise turned out to be a promising game thanks to a team that saw it as an opportunity. It was obviously still very, very flawed, but instead of rolling over and making something generic and forgettable, they aimed way higher and made something far more ambitious and memorable, and with another few months of balancing, it would have made for a solid fantasy adventure. And with that, we wrap up the video on the strange Skittles fantasy game. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. If you did and you want to support the channel, uh, hitting like and subscribe and commenting and all that stuff helps out. Or you can support on patrons and I'm about to thank all my patrons. But before I do, uh, I just want to share a speed run of this game where it's, 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 it's one of those speed runs where they're like going out of bounds and glitching the hell out of it and just flying through the whole thing. Uh, it's, it's by Lizstar and it's a games done quick speed run and it's super entertaining and they share tidbits about the game and uh, definitely worth a watch. I'm going to link that down in the description. And uh, yeah, now I want to thank all my patrons, including the ones coming up on the screen, and especially including my $5 patrons, Adam Beals, Analog Man, Anthony Gallagher, Anthony Heisel, Aradina Varen, Big J, Blake Barnett, Boggy Online, Connor Salinas, Cuggles, Daniel Gold, Devin Grandal, Dominic Chikoki, Doe Pants, uh, Down the Ket Hole, Evil Chicken, Hazardous Kirby, Jared Kernop, Jay Ghouls, Jenny McGlynn, Casey, Kane Ramsey, Kayla Labcat, Lucas Ray Sevic, Maximilian Kunz Maun, uh, May Arise, Mazaki, Melanie G, Michael Brennan, Mini Me Prefers Shorter Patreon Names, Mustache Duct Tape, Mrs. Mini Me, Oscar, Peaceful Kumquat, Plague, Raven, Riddlin' for Kids, Scott Hazlitt, Sky Panthera, Siami Yusuf, Tia, Terence Clint, Test Drive Unlimited 2, The Great City of Lawrence, Kansas, The Last Great Opium Den, Thomas Dansgaard, Thomas Damsgaard rather, Traplor Ross, Trevor Corbin, Trixie Emerson, Riding on Games, and Zindictive. Thank you all for watching. Uh, thank you as always, everyone, for supporting this channel, and uh, I'll see you all in the next video. Oh, and for everyone who's asking if I'm doing a Mafia video, I am doing a Mafia video. So, yeah, cool. Take it easy. Bye.